crazy stuff really hits the fan. It's your generation that's going to have to deal with it for our kids and our grandkids, you know. That's who I think about. Got your Bibles? It's good to have a Bible. Good to bring a Bible to church with you. Uh, you know, I use, I use my iPad a lot, but I always, bring, I always got my Bible with me just as much as I can. I just, because there are times I'll look back over it. This Labor Day weekend, I want to share with you a thought called Bear This Burden With Me. You know what's coming up. You know that we're moving toward uh, our car show, uh, Muscle Car Sunday. Some of you have never been out to the other campus. You don't know what's going on there, but that's it's 110 acres. And uh, matter of fact, our ponds are full. Thank you, Jesus. As that rain hit yesterday, they're down three foot. Now they're overflowing. So we've been blessed um, with that, except for Josiah's house. Electricity hit his house. And I mean, um, what's that thing? Lightning hit his house. Speaking of electricity and blew the wires off the pole, and so he's going to be staying with his pastor for a few days until we get that fixed, but we'll get it, we'll get it done there, so thank God for that. But this car show started a long time ago, and it, it's a passion of mine to reach people, unchurched, unchurched believers, uh, folk that don't know God at all, to try to find to do that, a way to do that. And I know coming to church is very important. We come here, we get fed, we enjoy worship, we're people of the king. But on top of all that, we still need to do the commandments that said, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, and reach people for uh, Christ's sake. Can I get an amen? So we're going to do this the best way we can. And by doing that, normally it's through serving and to serve others. So it's a burden that I've got. I do believe it has an expiration date. You know, just like vehicles that may, uh, we may someday be the Jetsons. We may all be in electric cars and no gas, God forbid. But because of that, those cars from the 50s, 60s, and early 70s are still extremely popular. Amen. The, the four-wheel drives you see, uh, you know, motorcycles. I, I got another Harley, and, uh, you know, I'm fixing it up now for the long haul. Keith, you know, just I think about this could be my last scooter, you know. And so I, I, I do these things as I, I, I progress forward. But everything I got is to reach somebody. I use them as hooks to reach folk, whether it be my Harley or my hot rod back in the day, even my horses. But I want to talk to you about business here real quick, being Labor Day. And I want to lay some principles out for you, uh, just some commandments, if you would. Number one, with whom you go is more important than where you go. It's who you hang around with that's going to make you a success or not. I've said this for years. You tell me who you hang out with, I'll tell you who you are. And it's up to you to decide who you want to hang out with. And this is something we share with our, our, our teenagers, our kids, and those around us. Whether they take our advice or not, we learned it a long time ago. I'm, th I'm very thankful that most of the men that I hung out with when I was a young guy are still alive and have actually turned in into a very good producing adults when we all should have been dead. Get again, amen. I mean, if you, some of you might have had a childhood like mine. I, when I look at my guys, I think, man, I'm, I, I, they've done real well. <laughs> I appreciate that. Number two, execution is critical. How you do what you do is how you execute it. Number three, pay attention to the product before the profits or make sure the product works. You know, to me, somebody says, Pastor, you're a good salesman. That's because I believe in my product. I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe in the king. Amen. It's easy for me to promote that product. Same way in business. Number four, you have to spend money to make money. Some people don't believe that, but you got to let go of some things. Amen. As finances come in, you got to learn how to, to let it go. Again, if your inflow is greater than your outflow, your upkeep is your downfall. That's in business, and that's in your personal life. If, you, if credit cards own you, if your mortgage owns you, if your vehicle, uh, you've got to have a new vehicle and, and your outflow is greater than your inflow, your upkeep will be your downfall. So make sure you get this thing right and balance it out correctly. It's the way I have uh, pastored this church, business this church, in my own life ever since. It is important to plow back some of your profits into research and development. In other words, look at life and say, okay, now I, I need to check this. It may not turn out well, but I need to research some stuff. Uh, going to conferences are important for church life, but also in business to, to uh, develop things. Number six, don't be afraid to fail. That's how you learn. Amen. Failure. How many things have we tried that didn't work out real well? We still tried it, though. Can I get an Amen. So don't be, a be afraid to fail. Number seven, provide your future employees with an environment that stresses individual accountability and rewards. Amen. Now, I'm always checking on our staff, but also make sure that they're rewarded too. It ain't just their paycheck. 
It's to make sure that other things come into their life. And one of the great rewards they have are you. You've been a blessing to the staff of the Little Country Church and the volunteers there. So make sure you keep doing that and, and build that environment. Share the rewards, power and profits for the people. Number nine, be the best that you can be. Number 10, have fun. I told the band we had a practice on Thursday. By the way, this Tuesday and Wednesday, I will be preaching the, uh, the Muscle Car Sunday message to you Tuesday night here, Wednesday night in New Caney. Make sure that you've heard it. Make sure you're here for that. I need, I need to practice, and you need to hear it again. Can I get an amen? I need to practice. You need to hear it again. And, uh, and I, the more I go over it again, the more excited I get about it. It's, it's really good. But the band, I, I just told the band, have fun. If you have fun, the people have fun. Amen. Don't, don't get too, too nervous about it. So the words I learned to live with, purpose and balance in life, I, I, I live by purpose. There's a reason why I get up in the morning, but also to keep balance. Balance is so important. This week I got a phone call from a man who did not know me. As a matter of fact, he came to this church right here this week and was upset that I wasn't here because he was looking for Jerry. He, for two, for two, he said he drove two hours to come to talk with Jerry. Amen. And Jerry wasn't here. So when he called out at the office, I said, hey, I, I, we have two churches. We have a camp, yada, yada. And he said, I got a Bible study with this young lady. And I said, well, that's sweet of you. And he said, I just got to ask you a question. And I said, go ahead. And he said, uh, how do you baptize? So I'm thinking, okay, you drove two hours to ask me how I baptize. So I said, sir, I baptize in water, submersion, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord Jesus, how the disciples. And we, we baptize after people repented of their sins. He said, do you do it for remission? I said, sir, I just told you how I baptize. But do you do it for remission? I said, where do you live? He told me. I said, what church you go to? He told me. And I, and I said, okay, listen, you're Church of Christ. You believe you got to be baptized to go to heaven. I understand. I know your theology front and back. Amen. But I'm not here to argue with that. Uh, you're not going to pull me into your lifeless religion. I ain't going there. Amen. I mean, I like music in church. I like lifting my hands. I like worship. I like having fun. Amen. I don't want to sing out of a hymnal. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to tell everybody you got to get dunked to get saved. I believe, but I do believe in baptism. You hear what I'm saying? The issue there is balance. Everybody say balance. Learning how to be a balanced person in a very unbalanced world, and even among religion. Religion can get off balance. I could have very easily said to him, you mean the remission of Acts 2.38? It says, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is that what you're talking about? Because you tell church Christ God that, they'll freak out because they don't want anything to do with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we uh, hung up the phone and left him disgusted. Uh, but, but a vision, watch this, a vision without a task is a dream. A vision without a task is a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery. If you're doing something and you don't have a vision to do it, if you're working a job and you don't have a heart to do it, it becomes drudgery. Amen. You've got to enjoy what it is that you're doing and a vision to do that for you. So a task without a vision is drudgery. And in my life, you know, as we're moving toward the car show, I, I want to have a lot of fun. Amen. I want to enjoy this moment. I, I never know when it's going to be the last one. So for me, I, I've got to have this vision for that. And a vision with a task is hope for the world. If you have a vision, you know, I mentioned my daughter, where she's at right now. The man that started that had a vision for the world. But he realized in order to do that, he had to acclimate the kids to the places that they were going to go. That, you know, Jill said, Pastor, I get, a, I get one shower a week and I get it out of a bucket. And she said, this week, I took a bucket of water, and I, and I drew it up early. And I get, I get to take a shower on Wednesdays. So I drew the bucket up. You don't know my daughter. She can stay in the shower for 45 minutes. It runs forever when she's in there. So to, for me to hear that she's got a bucket of water, she, and she said, I left it out in the sun. She said, I had a warm shower for the first time in, in a couple of weeks. And I thought, okay, now you're smart. You're getting smart there, kid. Amen. But to do that, that, that that's, something, that's somebody with a vision. Amen. To touch and change the world and started teaching people that. So questions all pastors should have. How do I get more people involved in the vision of the church? Of course, ours is win, win the lost, integrate and nurture people. So we're going to have to reach people. We've got to win people. Amen. So how do you get them involved? How do we keep those that God sends us? How, how do you know who is to stay and who's not to stay? How, and I'm just going to run through this quick. How do you run a church with spiritual authority without coming across as a controller, a dictator? How do you maintain relationships? 
relationship without becoming overly familiar. Some people get nervous about being over. They say, Pastor, you know, sometimes you're overly familiar. You're, you're out there in front. You're shaking hands with people. You're always visiting people. You're doing this at the hospital. Can I tell you something? My mom has been my mom now for 61 years. I'm very familiar with her, and we still love each other. You hear me? I don't think you can literally be overly familiar as a pastor. There needs to be a, at least a, an understanding of accessibility because a lot of, I know a lot of pastors, they are not accessible to the people. They, and I'm not being mean to you. I'm just telling you, yeah, they, they come through one door and they go out the back door and you're not going to see them and talk to them until next Sunday. Amen. They, they're, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to pick on them. That's just what they do. This is just who I am. So, so how, how do you maintain it? How do you convince the people that you are? And by the way, let me speak of this familiarity. I appreciate you giving me and my family space. You, you don't bother me, seriously. I don't have people bother me or bug me or run it, you know, come, come by my house all the time. Very seldom does that happen in my life. That's your fault, and I thank you for that. Amen. You know when you're invited, and you know when you stay away, right? Okay. Uh, how do you convince the people that you're here for the long haul? Well, I think you guys already know after 19 years. Uh, how do you transfer the vision God gave you for a church to the people? And who is with us? And who are, So if I was somewhere else preaching, I would say this stuff. Who is with us and who are just among us? Hear me. Some folk with you. Some folk just among you. Amen. Some with you. Some just among you. And, and then motives. How are you going to deal with that? So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to uh, skip down to verse 27. But Paul goes through this, uh, this litmus test of who he was. He talks about being a Hebrew, an Israelite, a Benjamin, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Amen. He talks about being in prison, being flogged uh, with, 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 with a, a cord of nine tails and, 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 and canes. Uh, amen. Uh, he talks about being beaten with rods, uh, being stoned. Do you, do you know the issue of being beaten with rods? Now, this is also in the Scripture, if you back to beaten with rods. This is what beaten with rods is. To those that lived in that era during the Roman times, they would take a man and tie him upside down. They would stick his feet in the air like this. You follow me? And they'd hold his feet like this, and they would tie him upside down. And they would take rods, and they would slap the bottoms of his feet. And they would do that 39 times. What that did was cripple them to where they could not go anywhere. Paul said, that happened to me three times. So a lot of times you'll read that, you think he got whipped across the back. He got flogged across the back. But beaten with rods is when they slapped his feet. And I, when I read that, I thought, how tender my feet are. Candy, that somebody would turn me upside down and slap my feet to try to stop you and prohibit you from going anywhere else to preach the gospel. Amen. He said, they did that to me. When I read this, I think about, again, being abandoned and being broken. And then he goes to verse 27. He said, I've labored and I've toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. Watch this, verse 28. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. There is a burden that you bear, whether you've gone through floggings and beatings and hunger, as every pastor, every leader, there's a burden you bear, amen, for being over the church. And having two churches and what we do, it, 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 it comes upon you. And if you don't have help, you're not going to stay. And the reason I've been able to be at the Little Country Church pastor for 19 years is tenacity, perseverance, but mainly because people have shared the burden with me. They come over, uh, come up and they've got underneath it, whether it be our staff, our pastors, amen, you, that you come under and you've helped me. Amen. You picked this thing up and you said, you know what? I'll carry that a little while. I'll smile for you while you're preaching, even if I don't like the sermon. Come on, smile over here. I'm looking for a smile. There it is. Thank you so much. Amen. Looking for smiles everywhere. So, so here Moses has got two million people that he leads out of Egypt, and they're moving toward the promised land. Well, on their way there, you know the issue of the detours and what he went through. But on his way there, he, had, he was Pastor Moses. He looked after the folk. And Exodus chapter 18, verse 13, tells us his father-in-law came to visit him. Thank God for good father-in-laws. For father-in-laws that look at a son-in-law and say, you know what? If my daughter's going to get any help out of here, I need to help you. Uh, every now and then, I get around my son-in-law and I go, you know what? My daughter really needs me to speak into your life right now. 
Amen. You need a little help working on your vehicle. I helped him with his Jeep this week. Amen. Taught him a few things, Tommy, he's never known before. Amen. I, I, little simple stuff. He went, wow, that, that's, that's a pretty good little trick right there. That's why they call me father-in-law. Exodus 18, verse 13. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. Now, again, they're out in the wilderness. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Well, Moses answered and said, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Now, this is important. There are times leaders love this power that, that the people come to them, when should I get a haircut? Who should I marry? Where should my kids go to school? Should I drive a Chevy? Amen. They're going to come to you and ask you stuff like that. And then I have to back off and say, hold on a minute. And I look at what Moses uh, was, uh, was taught by Jethro. I love the fact his name is Jethro. His father-in-law. So Jethro said to him, what you are doing is not good. Excuse me? I thought I was Pastor Moses, and I get to hang out with the people every day, tell them how to, what the will of God is. It, so Moses' father-in-law said, what you do is not good. And these people who come to you, they will only wear yourself out. They're going to wear you out, Moses. You ain't going to be able to make it. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Verse 19, now listen to me, Moses. Pastor Moses, and I will give you some advice. I'm glad he didn't say counsel. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and the laws and show them the way to live, be an example, and the duties which they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, and fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide for themselves that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law, did everything he said. He chose capable men from all of Israel, made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, and they served as judges for the people at all times the difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided for themselves. Listen, you do not have to bring every simple uh, situation to the pastors of this church, to myself. Some things you can do yourself. You can figure it out. You can say, you know what? And when people call me and say, well, what color do you think this ought to be? Listen, do I look like an interior decorator to you? I'm fortunate to dress myself on Sunday morning. Amen. I, I, so I will say stuff like, I don't care. And then they think, well, he don't care. Well, he just don't care. Well, I, I mean, I don't want it mauve. I don't want it pink. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? So a lot of times we, we do this in family life and we do it in church life and business life. So Moses had to set people that were over. You know what? The people he put over a thousand were men that can handle a thousand. Men that were over a hundred were men that can handle a hundred. Some over 50 because they can handle 50. Some are over 10 because they can handle 10. As we move into more things into this church, we will have leaders, men and women that will step up and they will take over certain areas and they will do certain things. That's, you know, I've not, I don't do a lot of, I don't do staff meetings. We get together and drink coffee on, uh, during the week. I, I very seldom gather people together to do things. Uh, I, so we call servant leaders and people just come up and say, hey, I want to serve. I didn't ask Frank to have the parking lot striped. He didn't come to me and say, hey, do what color you want the parking lot striped? Thank you. But I thank God it's yellow. <laughs> Can I get an amen? You know, Mike gets back in and starts putting sheetrock up in the back of the building. you got to make this church your church. Amen. Now, you know, you get out and you look at the flag. I saw somebody last week come out and they looked at the flag and it was tattered and they looked over at me like they was mad at me. Look, I love a tattered flag. Tattered flag speaks volumes to me. I love a glory-looking tatter. But when it gets too bad, somebody go out there and change the flag. Don't look at me like I, I got to go out there and change the flag. Hello. I'm taking my advice from Jethro. 
Can I get an amen? amen. So the Bible, I, I know it's a little heavy, but y'all need to hear this. This is why it's a good time to preach it on, on Labor Day weekend because there's not a lot of folk here to get offended. <laughs> but he said people with a willing heart. They were willing to do this, to, to make it happen. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, A psalm of David, the Lord said unto my soul, Sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. This scripture also goes into the New Testament. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Now watch this, verse 3. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning thou hast. And I love that. It's almost poetic. The womb of the morning. Every morning is like a womb that births out new stuff. He looked at that and said, the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Amen. You've got the excitement of youth. But look, at your people will be willing. You know what makes the burden light is a willing people, a people that are willing. It doesn't mean that you always agree with everything that you hear from this pulpit, but you're willing to do something for God. The word people in the Hebrew language means a, con a congregated unit, congregation, congregated unit, a tribe, family, troops. Nation to overshadow by huddling together. They always would huddle together. It's like a, a Thanksgiving all the time or Christmas, that huddle. The huddle represents a strategy. Whenever you see huddle, you know, we understand it through football and other places like that. It, it's a strategy is given. It's a play is called. David is given a messianic prophecy in this passage of Scripture. It's like he sets a group of people in a huddle, devising a plan. The huddle represents a team or unity. Teams that don't bond can't build. Teams that don't bond can't build. If we can't bond, if we can't connect, we can't build together. Amen. You want to see our churches grow? Amen. Then we got to bond together. Amen. We got to connect together. Teams that don't do it. Keys to a great team, of course, common goal. We got to win, integrate, nurture, cooperation, working together, communication. Amen. Talking. If you don't have the answer, ask somebody. Commitment. Care for one another. Individualism wins trophies. You know, I don't watch tennis. I, I, I don't know. I just never been. I never had the legs to play it. I guess, but I've never been a great big guy with tennis. I like team sports. I like with sports. I, I like basketball and baseball and football. Amen. Don't understand soccer. Uh, but but anyway, they, I, there's something about a team that comes together. So individualism, amen, wins trophies, but teamwork wins championships. To come together as a team. The huddle represents action. The world is not impressed with the huddle. They want to know if the plan you have is going to work. In order for the plan to work, everyone must do their part. But for now, oh, how many years? I've been, uh, next year, I will be a pastor for 30 years. Next year, 30 years. Next year, actually, I'll be preaching for 40 years. During that time, there were years spent just trying to get a plan. Trying to have vision, decide what to do. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I asking the people to do what they're doing? Amen. It was so important to just set that before folk and to help them understand. You know, it, people are not impressed when, when you're in the huddle. It's when you break out and you decide, okay, this is what we're going to do. And for years, we've been able to make something happen that's, uh, that started out literally with two cars. And not only that, we got a conference coming up right after that, a gathering of our people to celebrate 19 years as a church. 19 years. That, I was talking to Bishop Gary McIntosh this week. I said 19. He was blown away. Man, 19 years is twice as long as you've ever pastored anywhere. Uh, that, that, that's really good. Hallelujah. So David sees a people of strategy, a people of unity and, and action. The number one characteristic of those people was willing. Everybody say willing. Well, willing, the word in the Hebrew is free, free will, free will offering, freely, plentiful, voluntarily, amen, willing to, to, to offer, to volunteer as a soldier, to, to be present spontaneously. A team with no desire will never accomplish anything. You got to have a passion to win. That that's what is one reason why I'm a sportsman. I love sports because of that. I love to see that kind of passion. Psalm 110, verse 3, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. They're going to be volunteers. The power of a willing heart. Exodus chapter 35. Moses. Let's get back to Moses. Pastor Moses is out there among the people. God speaks to him and says, we need to have a church. We need to have a tabernacle. We need to have a place where I can meet with you and the people. And Moses spoke unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord. There's one thing that gets my crawl among preachers, and that is when sometimes people, our pastors, demand an offering. 
offering. I actually saw a young pastor get upset with his congregation because they didn't buy him a specific watch, a, a, a Modeva, a Mudeva. A, a he chewed his congregation out. Because it was pastor appreciation, and they didn't get him a specific watch. And I'm looking at this idiot, and I'm thinking to myself, you're an idiot. Amen. First off, never demand anything from the people. Don't you do that. I mean, I, I, we put demand for the gospel, but I ain't never going to make you do something, to make you give something you ain't got. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. But here's the separation. There's a separation between offering and the tithe. The 10%. And so at this moment, Moses says, hey, we got to build this thing. So I'm asking everybody that's willing. Everybody say willing. Everybody that's willing to bring forth. So in chapter 35, verse 21, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up. The heart was stirred. We need a church. We need this place paid off. We need to, to a place to meet with God. And everyone with whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all his service and for all the holy garments. So it was, to, it was to buy clothing for the priest. Amen. It was to take care of the things, all the implements inside of the church. And they came, both men and women, as many were willing-hearted. And they brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and jewels of gold of every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. Now, again, this is offering. This is over and above their tithe. They were already commanded to tithe. They always gave tithe. That was, that was a given for them. But the offering was over and above. Next Sunday, we will take two offerings. I've already mentioned this to you. I'm getting you ready for it. Amen. To prepare you that next Sunday, bring an offering, an extra offering to help take care of the expenses of Muscle Car Sunday and our 19th anniversary. Let's not weigh this thing out or wait till the crock pots are full. Let's go ahead and take care of this. Can I get an Amen. Come on, get a big amen. It's willing. You got to be willing. Years ago, we were going to pay the church off, and, and gold hit $1,700 an ounce. And I announced to this church, hey, guys, bring us your gold. And people started bringing gold. You know how much gold y'all had? About $17,000 a week for a while, we had gold. Amen. And turned it in and paid off our churches. Can we give God praise for that? Here's the thing. And many of you, many of you, you didn't miss any of that gold. You've had it stuck back, trying to figure out which one of them great-grandkids you was going to give it to that didn't want it. Earrings and necklaces, all kinds of stuff. So all that gold came in. But I kept one ring. I kept one ring. Richard Goldlightly had gone through a divorce with his wife, amen, and God told me I was to be his friend. I didn't even know Richard did. He played lead guitar, barely could even pick a guitar, amen. And I became his friend, amen, and for six, seven, eight years, we mowed grass together, we rode together, we hunted together, but I kept his ring, and he didn't know it. He turned his, ring, his gold ring in from his wife, and I kept that ring, and I held it. And if you'll remember last year, or was it last year? Last year when we were out on the uh, campus over there, and we're standing, I'm standing up there on that uh, on that trailer and we're preaching to the, the crowd that came in cars some of you don't even know this happened Richard was leaving to go reunite with his wife in Arkansas after all these years God was putting him back with his wife and that's what we prayed for so as I put him on the stage and we prayed over him I reached in my pocket and I pulled out a gold ring and it was his wedding band and I gave it back to him when you get an answered prayer like that, I knew I wasn't going to turn all that gold in. And I thought, you don't need to give up that wedding ring just yet, because if you do, you're giving up hope. And he never knew I kept that ring till that day. Hopefully he's watching right now. We'll send a large offering for what his pastor done for him. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. So it's a people of agreement. It's just agreeing. I, you know what? I want to make this event. It's just a uh, pastor never asked for two offerings. I can't remember the last time he's ever done anything like this. But I want to make sure I have an offering. I got my tithe. I want to make sure that it's a blessing next week when this thing takes place. It's a people of agreement. Amos said, how can two people walk together except they agree? Genesis 11 tells us, amen, they can do anything their heart can imagine as they were building a tower that is called the Tower of Babel. 
Amen. God knew it. If people are agreeing, there's nothing they can. This is why the churches need to start agreeing a little bit more. Can I get an amen? We can get a whole lot done if we agree. A people of agreement. Matthew 18, 19 says, again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Jesus said this, for where two or three come together in my name, I'm going to be with them. I'll be in the midst of them. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. God never intended you to be alone. God never intended, even in this house, God puts the lonely in families, the Scripture says. This is your family. Amen. He puts us here so we can connect with one another. You got another family out in New Caney you need to connect with. You got a world family out there. You're going to find out there are people all around the world that believe the way you do, and that you have a love for Jesus. Amen. And it connects you as family. Uh, two are better than one. Two trees in the garden. Two testaments. Two great lights. The sun and the moon. Noah loaded the ark two by two. Two commandments to rest, to rest on. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Your neighbor as yourself. Two tablets of stone. Amen. It had the Ten Commandments. There is something special about agreement. Let me start closing here. A people that serve. John chapter 6 tells us the feeding of the multitude. When I was thinking about, what you know, how did Jesus do it? Well, Jesus looked at people, 5,000 men plus women and children, and he got a little boy's sack lunch, and he told the disciples to tell them to sit down. And the people sat down in companies of 50 and 100, and he prayed over the fish. You know what happened. The fish, he snapped the fish. The head grew a tail. The tail grew a head. Snapped the fish, head grew a tail, tail grew a head. He gave it to the disciples. When Peter snapped the fish, the head grew a tail, and the tail grew a head. When no doubt and Thomas snapped the fish, he had to be shocked. Because the head grew a tail. It's the only way it could happen. And they walked through the crowd and they began to feed all the people sitting in companies. Again, just like Jethro told Moses, some over a thousand, some over 150 and 10. They began to do that. And 12 baskets were left over. How many disciples were there? 12. Oh, he's good with math, isn't he? Amen. And they had those, and by the way, let me just break this down a little bit more. They put them in a boat with them, stuck it between their legs, headed out, Matthew 14, across the water. As they moved across the water, the water started breaking over into the boat. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. They start screaming and hollering for help. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water with him, and he sinks when he saw the wind. He get back in the boat. Where was the bread? In the boat. You know what happens to us when we're going through hard times in life? We forget the miracle of yesterday. We forgot how God fed us the day before. Amen. Don't forget the miracles right there. Hang on to your miracle. Amen. Did I say it's closing? Okay. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 tells us, And he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Why was Moses wearing himself out? Because he was doing it all. How do you stop from doing, from doing it all? Give people something to do. Tell them, say, look, guys, if you'll help me with this, if you'll bear the burden, if I can help mature you, oh, we need people to park cars. Amen. We need people to cook. We need people not only just park cars, but then we need to go work a bounce house. Amen. We need folks all over that property that are going to do things. I need guys that are going to drive tractors or sisters. I don't care. Amen. We got to have tractors and trailers, and we got we got to get people. And some of you say, "Well, you know what, Pastor? I don't think I'm gonna come out that day." I, I, even if you can't do any of what I'm asking, if you could just come and smile at people when they come in the tabernacle, Amen. If you could greet them with the love of Jesus and say, "You know, uh, uh, I, that I was doing that over there," just cause you ain't doing it now, just transition over just to show up. Invite people to come out. You see somebody on a motorcycle. Say, you have been to Muscle Car Sunday. It's an event that's been going on for over 20 years. Hey, Amen. Would you come on out to the ranch? You see somebody in a car. Invite them out. And not only that, just invite people. We're going to have pet and zoos and things of that nature. And again, this is one reason we're raising the money to take care of. But kids need to have a good day. Kids need to have a good day. Amen. They need to enjoy themselves for a day. So it's not only going to be a day of reaching out to folk, but it's going to be a day of connecting with people. Amen. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Jesus, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, unto the measure of the fullness of God. Work. Work. The word work there, the work of the ministry, is to toil as an act of effort and deeds, ministry and attendance, gathering. And it takes a covenant, people. A covenant is a solemn and binding agreement or compact. God made a covenant with you and me, 
and he expects covenant back from us. The book of Leviticus, chapter 27, verse 30, now breaks on into the tithe. Something I've not preached on in a couple of years. A tithe of everything from the Lord, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to him. The word tithe, of course, is the tenth, a tenth part. When you tithe, you enter into a covenant with God concerning your money. But let me tell you this. I do not believe when we get to heaven, God's going to look at you and say, you know what, you had a deficit when it came to your tithe. Yep, you, you worked 40 years and you only gave four months. I don't think God's going to do that. With my tithe, I don't think I'm going to tithe in heaven. I get one chance, and that's here, to get, be in covenant with God and connect with Him. But it does something to me because I know this. God knows I'm a giver. He knows I'm going to be a blessing to the house and those around me. I'm going to give offerings, and I'm going to give tithe. And because of that, God has never allowed me to go without. He finds a way. When I felt like I had nothing, I was still giving, and God blessed. I'm not boasting on me. I'm just telling you, this is one principle that I just don't violate. I stay on it. I look after it, and I make sure it takes place among me and my family. So Proverbs 3 says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits. That's the tithe, the first of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, I can't help that pastors have abused this. And they have used this, and evangelists have used this. And, and I, I have a f dear friend, a dear friend who passed away a while back who was taken advantage of by scoundrels, taken advantage of by schemers who used the gospel to pull money from him. He fell into it and gave hundreds of thousands of dollars away to scammers. And yet the very people that look after him just got a little bit. It broke my heart for him. I wasn't after his money. Didn't need his money. But I, so I've seen people get skinned. I've often said you can skin sheep, excuse me, you can shear sheep a lot, but you can only skin one once. And a lot of people I met are getting healed up from being skinned. They come to church, and the last church they were at were skinned. They were just all they heard was about giving money. It's not going to happen here. I'm not going to beg you. I'm going to ask you to have a willing heart, amen, to be a tither and also learn when it's necessary to give an offering. So what kind of people does a good pastor need or any pastor need? A people with a willing spirit, a people of agreement, a people that serve, and a covenant people. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that I believe in my heart that everybody here loves you. Showed up on Labor Day weekend. God, I ask your blessing to be upon them. And they take this word that I've shared and they season it with grace and understand your spirit is upon them to be willing. I thank you, God, for success that's coming ahead. The success we're going to have will depend on you, your presence, and your willing people. Make us willing in the day of your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you still love God and your pastor, give God a praise. I shouldn't have said it that way. I should have said, if you love your pastor, give, let me hear it. Because uh, I threw God in there, and that kind of intimidates you because you're getting, okay, I got I to gotta say, I love God too, you know. Hey, Amen. He kind of slipped that one over on me. If I get our servant leaders to come up. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. You can invite somebody. We're going to have some fun here. How many remember the series I preached on detours? Do you understand that it was detours that led you here? Everything you've gone through in life brought you into this house. Amen. It was detours that done that. And I, we're going to break it down in such a fun way to help you understand it again. And, and, and as I'm going through it, I mean, I get more and more excited. But it was detours that brought me here. Amen. The detour I took to get to the little country church and back to Crosby again is absolutely crazy. And, I, and it, what, in, in the one big word I see, and I remind me again, Joseph, to put this thing in my sermon, providence. is when God exposes his hand. Amen. You didn't see his hand in the middle of it, but when it was over, you look back and say, I saw the hand of God in that. Amen. I saw what he was doing. By the way, uh, Hannah, I loved your testimony. Amen. About, uh, uh, I just go, it, you put it public, so I'll say, about drinking and, and being uh, 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 drunk free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Amen. It's one thing to drink, another thing to get drunk. So uh, being drunk free is a wonderful thing. Amen. You need to be proud of that woman. But my God, what a testimony. I loved it. I appreciate you sharing that with people. Uh, uh, you know, we, we'll go through life and we don't realize that what we've been delivered from something, what God blessed us with something, is to have other people. Amen. You know, whether you broke addictions, you need to be around other people that break them also. Amen. As we give today, we believe in God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Guys in the back are sign-up sheets. Uh, just please walk by. Maybe there's one or two things you can sign up for. Amen. I know that Dana's dealing with, with baked goods. And uh, uh, if, you got, if you want to give something toward that, there will be ribbons given toward baked goods. Uh, we need kitchen help. We're going to need parking. Uh, tractors, if you plan on driving a tractor, you got a tractor and a trailer, please sign up in the back. You can tell me, I'll forget. If you sign up, put your phone number in it, I will not forget. I know you want to tell Pastor Dave and Pastor Joseph and others, would you, you know, I'll show up and help. Please sign up. That way we know, amen, what might be needed. Uh, children's help, help out in the, uh, for children's church. In the nursery, there's all kinds. We've got bounce houses. We're going to be there. We're going to need somebody to be over for a couple of hours. Just sign up there and commit yourself. You know, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what I'm going to be doing on the 18th. I'm giving you something to do on the 18th. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing on the 18th. Tell you what you're doing. You're going to, we're not having church here. Won't be no church here. So I'll go be out in New Caney. Well, I've never been out there. Well, good. Come on out. Amen. We're going to invite folk both places, right, Parker? Amen. Give Pastor David a hand as he comes. 